Hey, I'm Jake Miller. Thanks for joining us for Tree Stuff's Splicing Rigging Slings webinar with host Peter DeVries. We're really excited about this webinar because it's interactive. Splicing Jedi Peter DeVries is going to demonstrate and walk all of us through each step on how to make three different types of slings. Peter's also going to be answering your questions throughout the webinar and will be offering two ISA CEUs to those with a passing grade on the quiz of this webinar. We'll post the link to the uh, quiz after the webinar. And we want to give you a heads up. This webinar is for educational purposes. And we recommend that anyone who creates a sling through this webinar should definitely have it tested before using it. So grab all your materials and get ready. Live from the Great White North, here's Peter DeVries. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Peter DeVries. Uh, if you don't know that already, uh, also want to just say thanks uh, Jake and the whole team at Tree Stuff for having me on tonight to go over some uh, splicing and doing some rigging slings. Uh, also like to give a big thank you to Jason from uh, Teufelberger Ropes. Uh, he's supplied me with all the rope that I'll be using tonight during the demonstration. Uh, if you guys have any questions during the webinar, don't hesitate to ask and uh, we'll try and get them answered uh, accordingly and to the best of our knowledge. Uh, so let's make it interactive and uh, we'll probably get right to it because we've got a lot to go through. All right. So first thing uh, we're going to talk about is a little bit of uh, rope terminology. We'll get a piece of rope here. And um, this here is hollow braid. Uh, it's exactly like what it sounds like. It's hollow in the center. It's uh, basically made up of loosely woven single braid rope. It can be single carrier or double carrier. So this one is a double carrier. You see right here. And um, so hollow braid, it's made up of uh, strands and each strand is made up of many uh, separate fibers. Um, we get into like break strength of the rope. It's the theoretical strength of a rope. And this is uh, der derived by averaging many tests to get that uh, breaking strength. And so one of the things we're going to talk about is the bitter end. Uh, this here is the bitter end, and then we're going to work down the rope. So I could be also working this way, just so you know. Um, but we'll always uh, start at the bitter end and work our way down the rope. And then lastly, um, lock stitch. That's uh, one method to secure a splice. Here I used an actual strand from the rope itself. So if you don't have um, whipping twine or threaded uh, wax twine, that's something that we, you can use as well. Um, I prefer doing a lock stitch when using a uh, hollow braid rope myself. Um, then we'll get into some measurements. Myself, I have a uh, mat here that has all the um, lengths that I need to measure out uh, for the slings and hollow braid, uh, the double braid. I also have some marks on my workbench for when I'm doing uh, loopy slings and whoopy slings. But there's other ways you can measure these um, using uh, tape measure, fids. Um, so we'll go. We'll talk about that. So first. Uh, it, we're going to go over what a, what a full fit is. Um, so full fit, that here, that's a full fit. Now this one here is for five eighths. So they range, I have fits ranging from quarter inch to one inch. So this one here happens to be five eighths. So that's again, full fit. That to get a full fit, you're adding a short fit section and a long fit section. So here on this fid, I don't know if you can see that, but there's the marks right here. So from the bottom to those marks, that's a short fid. And then from those marks to the tip 
is a long fid. So that's one way of measuring uh, the rope. And basically how they come up with a fid length, it's uh, the rope is calculated uh, 20 times the diameter of the rope. So as the rope increases, the fid length also increases. And um, then we'll get into some of the tools that I have on the workbench. Uh, if you're following along, uh, depending on the tools you have, you'll be able to probably keep up with me. Um, if it's your first time, uh, don't worry about it. If you get hung up, just follow, just follow along as you can. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to ask. So again, this will go over that's a tubular fid. And then this is another type of tubular fid called Selma fid. Makes uh, splicing hollow braid really easy. And then I have two different sizes of a Selma fid. So this can, uh, this is used to open up an area in the hollow braid so I can pass the hollow braid through, which we're gonna get to. Uh, this is just another uh, type of uh, Selma fid that I actually made up myself just for some larger rope. And then you have your wire fid. So all these can be used um, to uh, splice with tonight. So hopefully you have some of these and if not, you know where to buy them. Um, then you have some wax twine. Like I said, if you don't have any of this, you can always use a thread strand that we're gonna cut. And if you have a torch and some scissors, that will make your life a lot easier. So we'll get right into it. We're gonna start with um, a straight berry, um, just so we get used to uh, the rope. Uh, some of the terminology, how to mark the rope. So straight berry is exactly like it sounds. You're taking the bitter end and burying it straight into itself. So a lot of times you'll see this uh, used on uh, winch lines. Uh, that's probably the most you're... But it's a nice easy uh, splice to start out with. So we'll get right to that. I'm using half inch T-Rex. Um, so I'm going to use the correct measurements for that. If uh, you have half inch, great. If not, um, it doesn't really matter uh, for today because you're just learning. Um, so just follow along with whatever rope you have. Uh, and if you have instructions in front of you, great. If not, then, uh, like I said, I'll let you know what my lengths are that I'm using, and then you can go from there. So from the bitter end, we got, we got to get to a mark, our first mark, which is mark A. So from there, from the bitter end to mark A, we're going to measure out two fid lengths, which I have on my chart for half inch. So we got one at 11 inch and then another 11 inch. So we have our first mark, that's mark A. Then from mark A, we need mark B, which is our desired eye length. Whatever size eye you want that to be, it can be large, it can be smaller. At this point, it really doesn't matter, but that's where I have my mark, because we need that. So we have mark A, mark B. Now from there, we need mark C, which um, we are going to mark down three full fids. So that's 33 inches. So one, three, and marker. So we'll mark that. When I'm normally doing these, I won't mark them that heavy, but for today's purpose, uh, so you guys can see it easier, we'll mark them heavy. All right, so now we need to get the bitter end uh, from B to C, yes. So from bitter end to A is two fid lengths, then the size of your eye creates A and B, and then from B to C, is going to be three. So we're going to take now um, bitter end. We're going to attach that 
if you have a Selma FID, it's nice and easy because you're able to place it in there and it has a nice little tab on it to catch it while you're pulling it through. So if you don't have that, you can use a regular FID and tape, tape the end to it. Um, but before we get to that point, we're gonna mark a taper. So from A towards the bitter end, get that in the screen for you. So from A to the bitter end, we're going to count out six picks, which are these chevron right here. So we're going to count out six of those. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and mark that one. So that's our first mark. And then from there, we're going to mark out three more at five. So count out five picks. So one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And one more. One, two, three, four, five. So that's going to create our taper for the rope. So from there, we're going to remove these strands. So I'm going to use the Swedish FID to pull them out. When you're doing this, you not to catch any other strands. We'll take that off now. We don't need that. So I'm going to pull them out. Like I said, take your time. Be sure not to catch any extra strands when you're pulling it out. So there's one. So in these, once I have them all out, we're going to cut them off flush to the cordage. All right, and one more. Okay, so once we have those all pulled out, it should look something like this. And now we're going to cut all these out. So it's nice to have a good pair of scissors for this. And again, if you don't have any uh, whipping twine or wax thread, uh, you can keep... I would keep the longest cut strands that you have, and you can reuse those for the lock stitch at the end. All right, so now get back to your FID. So we need to create the eye. So we want this to go into B. So we have A and then B. So that's where we're going to enter the rope and bring it through and then match up our two marks again, A and B together. All right, so we'll do that. So this is going to, like I said, enter into um, B and going to exit out of the mark C that we made. All right. Okay. So you can get your fit in there. And you can milk the rope over top, make it slide a little bit easier. I'm using uh, Selma FID right now. 
So it has a little tab on the end that uh, catches the rope to help it uh, get pulled through. But if you have a regular FID, uh, to like a tubular FID, that will work as well. And uh, you just tape, tape the end. So there, it's coming through. And milk that through. So now I've sucked the uh, tail or the bitter end in. So I just can pull back to my mark. You should see that there. So from there, um, we want to take off the tape, off the end, and then you can fan out these last few pieces, last few strands, and we'll give that a nice taper. So you can take your scissors, and then just on a diagonal, cut up so you have a nice taper. And then from this point, from where point A and B are, you want to hold that tight, like so. And then you're going to milk the rope back onto itself, and the splice will disappear. So now you have a straight berry. So it'll look something like that. So we're not finished yet, because what did I say when we first started, or when I first started talking uh, with the terminology? We need to finish this uh, with a lock stitch. Uh, so we're going to do our lock stitch down here to prevent this splice from pulling back out, because all I have to do right now is pull back up on, on here, and that splice will just come out. So. Like I said, if you don't have any uh, wax thread or whipping twine, that's fine. Use one of the threads that you cut off from the rope. But I have some, so I'm going to use some. And then Sailmaker's needle. This is a large one. Makes it a little bit easier to use uh, with the hollow braid. So from here, I like to count down five picks. From this point so one two three four five and then that's where I start my lock stitch so you want to be careful not to catch strands try to go right down the center like so and leave a little bit of tail there all right so we're gonna go in and out three times on each side. So if you're following along, great. If not, just give me a second and we'll be done. If you have any questions now, I can have a look if there's anything. All right. So the nice thing with hollow braid, it's very easy to, to splice. It's nice to work with. And it's very easy to lock stitch. All right, so I got three down one side. I'm at two going on my third. So from here, I'm going to enter from my third stitch, but I'm going to twist it 90 degrees and come out this side and then run up here and down here three times as well now. Oh, yeah.
All right, so two on this side. Two on that side. All right. So we got three on one side. And now we're going for the third one to finish it off on this side. So same thing. We're going to go in here twist at 90 degrees and come out where your tail is of the whipping twine, thread wax, whatever you're using. So it'll be coming out just like that. And pull that through. Now we're gonna tie this off. And then give it a little twist and we're going to cut the excess twine off and get out your lighter or little torch and then we're going to melt that down. When you're doing that, you want to be careful obviously not to damage or burn any of the fibers in the rope. So there, now we have a your first sling, if you're following along, uh, straight berry. So that just kind of get you familiar with the rope, some of the terminology, some of the tools, because uh, now we're going to go on to uh, a s uh, locking brummel. And, uh, okay, we're going to answer a couple questions here, and then we'll get to the locking brummel. All right. Uh, thank you uh, for showing us that. I just want to go over a few little things um, quickly. If you could, uh, oh, please ignore the baby in the background. Uh, but if you could please give us a little overview of what it should look like when it's done. Um, what we're what you're looking for in a properly made straight uh, berry. Okay. So, well, you want. Your A, obviously, if you've done your marks, if you can see in there, there's mark B. So you want mark A and B to be lined up. You don't want any loose open fibers through here. So you want it to, so it's a nice tight splice all the way down to back to the hollow braid area. And then you also want to be able to feel a nice taper down kind of hard to see because of the angle but a nice smooth taper all the way back down to the regular or the the hollow the original hollow braid so you don't want it to be thick 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 and then all of a sudden right here really thin so then you don't have a nice taper does that answer the question yes that does yeah that that uh that helps me at least um, I have a question here from Gabrielle Falbo. Um, it is, uh, how many chevrons are there between each stitch as you're going up? Oh, okay. So, myself, when I'm using hollow braid, I'll bring that in nice and close. Every other every other chevron will have a stitch okay great um i i have one more question here uh i think for this time and it is uh carrie leeds is asking why stitch it like this rather than doing a couple of stitches and wrapping it round like on a climbing line does he mean uh like lock stitching, uh, doing a, a, a whip or a, like a whip stitch instead of lock stitch? I believe so. Uh, well, it's just preference. The, uh, like a lock stitch, if you can. Uh, hey, Carrie. Um, for me, I just like doing a lock stitch when I'm using hollow braid. 
when I'm splicing um, double braid, then I will do, I'll sit down here so you can see, um, when I do a double braid rope, then I tend to always do a uh, whip stitch. And, uh, but I just prefer doing a lock stitch on the hollow braid. It's just my preference. Does that answer your question? I think so. Um, they're on a little bit of a delay just because of how uh, the Facebook live stream works. So he'll be hearing what you're saying about uh, 20, 30 seconds after you say it. Uh, so we'll we'll hear from him in a minute here. Uh, in the meantime, what was the? Can you really quickly do the knot for finish off finishing off the lock stitch? Okay. So basically, I'm just doing an overhand a overhand knot. Here, let's see. I get. Just do that over again on another piece of rope. Just so it doesn't un it basically so it just doesn't untwine on itself. So we go in. over I'm just doing this very quickly so you can see this again so let's say this was my third one I'm gonna come up through here and then out where the tail is like so and then just a simple overhand knot or half knot and just pull that tight and then that gets sucked into the hollow braid and then all I do is just give it a little twist it's because it has wax on it. It tends to stick. And if you use T-Rex, it is waxy as well. And then cut that off and then get your torch out and then melt that down and finish it off. Nice and simple. All right, great. Thank you very much. Um, Carrie Lee seems to be pleased with your answer on the lock stitching. So I think we can go ahead and get started on the next one. The next. Slide. Okay. So we're going to move over to locking Brummel. So a little bit more next advanced uh, splice. Still very uh, a nice easy splice there. With hollow braid, they're all pretty uh, simple. So same idea, we're gonna create a eye, but now instead of bearing it directly into itself, we're gonna create these locks. So those are locking brummels. So we have one, then two, and then from that second one, then we will bury the tail or bitter end into the rope and then finish it off again with the lock stitching. All right, so here I am using a uh, three quarter inch. So I'm going to use the fit measurements for that. So we're starting off again, like we always do. All right, so we are gonna start at the bitter end again and mark our first mark, which will be A or end one. So from this point here, we are gonna do a full fid plus a um, quarter fid. So three quarter inch is 16 inches and quarter of that is four. So I'm gonna make a small little dot at 16. And then I have four inches over here and we'll mark that so you guys can see it at home. So that will be mark one. So that's the beginning of the splice. And then same thing, we need to create an eye. 
So again, we can make it as large or as, as small as you want. Uh, for a dead eye sling, it's nice to have a little bit larger eye because it depends on what you're using it for. So I'm going to probably use, mark out about 21 inches from A to B. So that will give me an eye about that size. So in the end, it's approximately 10 inches. So again, bitter end, a fit and a quarter is mark A. And then from mark A to mark B, I'm doing 21 inches. And that's how we are going to start this. So now we're going to use a Swedish fit. So that's that there. Uh, I have a larger one to use with the larger diameter rope and then obviously the smaller uh, Swedish fit for smaller diameter rope. So use your um, tools accordingly. So basically we're going to line up your A and B. Give me one second here. Let's see if we can get this working better here. All right. How's that? Okay, perfect. So we just recap bitter end, bit and a quarter to mark A, our desired eye length to mark B. So now we're going to create those locking brummels. So we're going to have the rope go in to itself and then back into itself. And then we'll finish it burying directly into the hollow braid. All right. So from mark B, we're going to split the rope in half. So with hollow braid, it's 12 strands. So it makes it really easy. You want to have six strands on both sides or three strands. It all depends on what you're using. But uh, so we have one, two, three. And then on this side, one, two, three. All right. So we're going to open that up. And we're going to pass the bitter end through. And again, be careful not to split any fibers because it's easy enough to go through a fiber like this. You don't want that. So make sure you are through, but not going through a strand. So from there, we're gonna pull that rope through, and bring that back into view. So we have our mark A and B, and we're going to line those up. So it looks like this. All right. So from there, you have mark A and B lined up. We have our I. Now we have to get the tail end through to the bitter end. So same, same thing. You're going to line up your uh, cordage. and pass your Swedish fid through. Again, so it looks like that. Open that up. Again, make sure not to catch any strands or extra fibers. And then take this end and pass that through the opening. If you got any twists in here, that's okay. We'll, uh, when it gets closer to the, e the, the end, we can straighten that out and get the twists out. So that's what you should have right now. And then that's going to create that lock. So you, you can see there's Mark B, 
or sorry, mark A and mark B, bring that back together, and then pull that through, and now you've created that lock. All right. So now we have this tail. We got to do something with that. So what what we have to do next is bring the tail into the hollow braid, just like we did the straight berry. So same idea. So we're gonna go in about two picks down, or sorry, up uh, from the last lock. Um, you can make right now for you guys, we'll do a mark. So we want it to go in right here. And then from there, uh, we are going to make another mark where we want the tail end to come out. So we want to be able to bury enough uh, into the rope. So when we milk it uh, clean, that there's no fibers left outside of the rope. So from the mark you just made, you can go from this at enter point, you're gonna do a full fid. So I have full fid at uh, three quarter inch is 16 inches plus a short fid, which is 4.75. So I can go from my mark, 16, do a little mark. And then from that mark, we're going to go down to here. And I'll mark that so you guys can see that. So again, from here to there. That's where we're going to exit. So you can take your wire fid. Selma fid, tubular fid, and then this is your wire. Again, and I, I can show you quickly, if you're using a wire fid, it's kind of the opposite of using a tubular fid. Obviously, you're going to go in the exit and out the entrance, basically. You're doing everything backwards because you're pulling it through, where when you're using a Selma fid or tubular fid, you're going into the entrance, pushing it through the rope, and then back out. So we're going to do that right now. I'm just going to flip the rope around here. Give me a little bit more space. All right. So we'll open up the strands here. Again, same thing. Be careful not to catch any strands or tear. And then you're going to come out. Of course, because we're doing it live, it doesn't want to. So they're coming out. And here you're going to, this is my homemade Swedish fid, or sorry, um, Selma fid. I'm going to put a little piece of tape on here because I don't have that tab that runs on the back side, like this one here. That would catch the rope as it's going through. So I'm going to grab a little piece of masking tape, painter's tape. And you just add that on like so. All right. So then from there, we're just going to push it through and start milking it back. And then. Uh, so after your uh, two uh, Brummels, uh, you're going to make a mark two picks down. And then you're going to mark your exit point here is a fid plus a short fid. So your full fid is 16 uh, using three quarter inch 
will be 16 inches plus 4.75 inches. So depending on what size of cordage you're using, but it's always going to be a full fid plus a short fid. All right, so now we can take the tape off this. Put that aside, keep that, reuse that for later. All right, so now that we have the tail end through, we got to create a taper. So what we're going to do here is half a fid. So for three quarter inch is 16, half a fid is eight. I have a mark here on my workbench that's eight inches. So from the bitter end to eight inches, just make a little mark like so. And this is, we're gonna take the tape off at this point. So there's different ways of um, creating a taper. You could, from this point, mark a couple strands. So you could mark, skip, mark, skip. But I'm just following the instructions from uh, New England. So I'm using their rope or Teufelberger. Um, so I'm going to use their instructions as well. So all they say here is to make that mark. Um, and then you're going to fan that out just like we did on the other rope and make a nice smooth taper. So depending on the rope you're using, that will dictate what they want you to do for your, for their taper. All right. I'm doing this all backwards because the camera is over here. Usually I'm working the other way around. So bear with me. So then you're just going to go from your mark and cut on a diagonal to create this, that taper. All right. And this is when it comes in handy to have nice sharp scissors, but also be careful not to cut yourself. I have done that a couple times. All right, and see the rest of it here. Okay, so we'll get rid of that. And now we are going to you know, hold down at the berry point. I like to just make sure so it's nice and tight and pull on that bitter end again and suck the hollow braid up to the locking brummel. And then a lot of times what I'll do is I'll just attach this to the carabiner so then I can get a nice tight lock and then I can milk it out like so. And sometimes it might take a couple milks to get all that rope buried back in. And there we go. So now we have a dead eye sling. And one thing you can do before um, you actually do this bury is you can add in a sh uh, chafe sleeve here that will help protect the eye um, for longevity of the rope. Um, but it also doesn't allow you to really inspect the rope as well, but just as a side point. So again, there's your two locks. And then we have buried into the splice or into the rope, sorry. The nice thing with uh, T-Rex too, or with um, if you have any multicolored ropes, it's nice to keep all the lines matched up. So just like the straight berry, I'm gonna move this so you guys can see. There we go. Uh, we're going to finish off this splice 
by lock stitching it again. So repeat. And that's how you get a lot better at anything. So again, if you don't have any whipping twine, that's fine. Use a cut strand, um, but whipping twine is pretty cheap. So I would recommend using that. It's easier to work with too. Um, sometimes the strands can be a little finicky and tough to get through the eye of the uh, needle. So same thing as the straight berry, count down myself, this is what I do. Uh, I always count down five, one, two, three, four, five. And then I'm gonna go in there and then out the other side. So same as the last time, three down each side, 90 degree turn, and then come back up the other two sides, tie them together, cut them off, and then melt them down. While I'm doing this, is there any questions regarding the locking Brummel? I have a question real quick that is what um why would you do a locking brummel as opposed to uh the straight berry that we that we did earlier um that's a good question why uh why why would you choose this over the other a straight berry um it it kind of does come down to preference um but I find that uh, for any rigging uh, scenarios, I like to use the uh, locking Brummel, but that's just personal preference. Um, but statistically, I believe a straight berry is stronger because you're not creating all these twists in the rope. It's basically just burying it back down itself. So why, I, but it's also easier to pull out. This is a lot harder to come apart where a straight berry, the only thing that's really locking that in is the Chinese finger trap of the rope and these stitches. So this, you have to blow through these stitches. This rope has to come back out and these two locks have to come undone for it to come loose if that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you. I don't think we have any other questions now. Oh, except for, um, let me find this person's name. Someone was asking, uh, if there are any books that you should get for, um, for, to, to learn splicing, any reading material. Uh, well, you know, there's lots of reading material out there. Um, just as kind of notes for myself, I have printed off, uh, depending on what manufacturer rope I'm using, I'll try to find their specs. Most of them are found on line. Um, there's also the splicing uh, manual from Samson. Um, it's a good resource as well um to purchase but again you can get all those pdfs uh also online um and then your next best thing would be um any series uh that are on online or to purchase and i believe you guys have one available and the next best thing would be going to a actual seminar um or weekend retreat that you're doing this for three days and that's going to really help uh, to get that knowledge and um, uh, I don't know, basically the knowledge for what, what you're doing. And you'll probably get to do more than just hollow braid. This is just kind of you start off with hollow braid because it's the easiest. So this is where I'm kind of I was saying if you're using um, the strand of the rope itself, it can untwine and make it difficult to go back through the eye. 
So I just had that with just the whipping twine myself because I cut it almost too short, just enough. Now, if I can tie a half knot, that'd be great. All right, so tie that off again. Give that a little twist, cut it off. Get your lighter out. The best thing is a torch like this. If you're going to be doing any of this. And again, be careful not to touch this or get close with the flame. And there you have your locking bromel dead eye. All right, fantastic. Um, I think we are going to head into our commercial break so that uh, you can get a little bit of uh, a break um, and everybody can do a bathroom break here. Then we'll do uh, any questions that anyone posts uh, after that. Uh, it's going to be about 10 minutes and then uh, we'll get on with our next ones. Excellent. Sounds good. All right. See you on the other side. Hey everybody, my name is Christian Michael Schultz and I've been asked to show my tree stuff. So it's kind of like a, just a tour of my, a tour of my haul bag, the, the gear that I carry around. I'm a contract climber so my needs are a little bit different so I carry a lot of climbing and rigging gear with me. If I was just punching clock and jumping up on a truck and going to serve you know, a customer base, this is what I would bring. I didn't do anything to the bag this is the way I, I pack it all down exactly the same every time like many climbers do so that i'm ready to just grab and go depending on you know the changing needs of wherever you know wherever i'm working and what my clients are like my clients are typically uh, tree service owner operator type people and um you know in training groups and things like that this is this is a bag that was issued to me by nats and it's killer i get a lot of compliments on this bag and it has nothing but line in it i think that there's like 275 feet of line with the splice tie i'm kind of specific about that and so i don't need to spill this out but this is my beloved metallius i think it's the half dome it might be the sentinel i know it was a gift from my man in Portland and this is this is exactly the way I pack it down every time I the friction savers as you as many of you know run the gamut of price range and purpose I'm a ring and re I'm, I'm an adjustable ring and ring guy and down in here hey check it out you're gonna dig this an OG Saka thank you Marty thank you so much for that piece of equipment man and I've got another lanyard here can you get a close-up of this one, Jake? Now, don't forget. I carry a brain bucket. Most of the time I carry an E-rated helmet because if I go to a company and we're doing line workout on the line, I wanna have an E-rated helmet. This time out when I split, I just grabbed um, my Super Plaz and it's got a Cena unit on board. The battery's charging at the moment. And these are nice, it's a, it's, it's a nice helmet. It drifts around a little bit on my melon a little bit so I've got to tighten it down a little bit but so far so good it's about my fifth or sixth one that I've chewed through. I carry a chesty for, for when I'm climbing SRS and I carry here's an extra rig right here with um with a hitch climber an ultra O and a Prusik. I think maybe I can't remember who made this one for me so I keep a back up there here's my harness and my climbing harness and it's pretty cool. I have a swivel on the bridge, again with another um, friction saver retrieval device, otherwise known as a five ace O-ring with some parachute cord on it. So I keep, I keep one on board my harness, one retriever on board my harness, and one, one close by my rope bag. I've got a, a CE style lanyard with a, with a swivel incorporated into it. This is really, really nice. And 
you know, it's it's got a it's got a black pinto, and a and a pinto, and uh, my Prusik I just find that with um with a hand spliced eyes that it fits in between the cheeks of the pinto a little bit better than sewn termination. Sewn terminations are okay. It's okay. It's a bit of a squeeze, as many of you know. And I keep a super smooth. The super, super smooth is really nice. I know this wasn't supposed to be a gear review. I do find the small hole a little bit difficult to thread with a spliced eye. So, and I find it difficult to set from the ground. But it is what it is, you know. And for my for, for my chainsaw, I keep a I keep a dual chainsaw lanyard. I try never to operate a chainsaw in the air without a lanyard. It's just a thing. Some companies that I work for require them, and I want to be you know I want to be able to, I want to be compliant. I don't want to be the guy that stands here and argues with administrative controls that are put in place because I know they're probably put in place for a reason. So I keep a dual lanyard on board. I don't have it with me. It's out in my out in my vehicle with my saw. But that's basically a rundown of my harness. It's pretty it's pretty general stuff. No major mods. You know I keep e earplugs in here in case I have to just you know cut and run. I don't like to be without ear protection. I don't I, I don't operate without hearing protection. It's just not something I wish to play with. So I keep muffs on board. But if I, I, if I double down, it'll reduce the noise a little bit. Nora schooled me up a little bit on that, but I can go into that another time. A good throw line kit to me, this is just me, no one has to follow the Christian Michael Schultz method, but a good throw line kit to me has three bags on board. So there's definitely a top one. I, I throw an eight or a, or a 10 ounce bag. I can throw a 12 ounce bag, although I'm, I'm, I'm an old guy, so I'm not very good with the 12 ounce bag. But there's one at, at the business end. This is the end that I throw. Then the opposite end, there's always another bag on the other end. And then I keep a carabiner with an additional bag on this gear loop on the outside as a baluster, just to add more weight if I need to situationally. I know I'm not the, I sure did not invent that concept. Many of the cool cats do that and it's really a good idea. It saved me so many times. I've also learned hard lessons in carrying only one throw line kit. So I carry two nowadays. So check it out. So there's one and here's my, my other throw line kit, and it is built and set up identical. Cats like Drew Nelson know that if he, he's welcome to use my throw line kit anytime he wants, because I know he's gonna restore it exactly the way that I have it. And the reason that I want it stored exactly the same way is because if I need this in a time sensitive situation, I know that I can spill it, open it, and throw it right away, you know, first time without worrying about if it's gonna open or close in, in an opposing direction or anything else like that. I know that certain certain cats that I hang with are gonna restore everything that, you, that they use exactly the way they, the way they found it. I keep um, the notch, the notch talon with the Silky Zoo bot, and I keep a fresh blade and I keep a backup blade. So uh, I would not be caught without a backup blade. I've learned hard lessons like that. I just don't think that if I show up at your house and I go out in the field with your crews that I need to whip out a dull blade. I just don't think that's fair to my clients. So I keep fresh blades around and, um, and I sterilize. Here's another hitch rig with a, with a hitch climber, an Ultra O, and a Prusik. Hey, check it out, I got a notch. What's this thing called, Jake? Jet this step. Is the notch jet step. I've yet to use one. And finally, I keep another Metalius rope bag right here. Check this out. This is cool. Tree Stuff carries these two. These are, I think they do. They used to carry it in like a Kelly green color that was kind of nice. I always liked black. And so, this sort of spills like this. Then I open this up and I keep a small carabiner on the spliced eye so that once I throw into the tree, I can connect this to the soft becket. Thank you, Jeff Perry. Jeff Perry was the one that said that I identified the little loop at the bottom of a higher quality um, throw bag as a soft becket. Thanks for schooling me, bro. So anyway, I'll connect up to this and then thread the tree with climbing line. And you know, depending on what I'm doing, if I'm gonna install this and uh, do a canopy anchor or something like that, I've got another line right here as a retrieval. I, I use geckos. I've yet to try the new notch spurs, the, the, notch, the notch geckos. Those look really, really nice too. They look really, really comfortable. And that's, that's about it, Jake. That's, that's my rig rundown. Oh, and here, you know something? Here's something, here's a piece of equipment I would never, ever be without. Now hold on, don't move, Jake. For the point, did you guys hear that? All right, here's another one. This one's gonna be even better. That nah, wasn't so good. <laughs> but anyway, that's, there you have it. There's my tree stuff.
was late in the day, you know, sun's out, and I was getting complacent. I went to make my cut, and towards the end, I didn't want it to roll into the water, and towards the end of the cut, I took one hand off the saw, put it on top of the stump. There was a knot on the back side of the wood, and the tip of the bar caught it. The way it kicked, it drove the saw right into uh, where my main artery, some more arteries right there. And it's probably saved my life. Pretty scary. It's nice to be able to rely on quality PPE. The pants are uh, amazing. They're breathable, comfortable, you know, they're, they're form fitting. I've worn all types of pants, and these are by far my favorite. Regardless of how good you think you are, accidents happen, it's worth $200. By the chainsaw pants, it might save your life, you know? Hi, I'm Kale Royer, head party animal at treestuff.com. I'm here to make sure that everyone knows about our Tree Stuff party program. Each month, volunteer arborists from different regions host free recreational climbing events powered by treestuff.com, giving local arborists a chance to meet, hang out, climb, and try out some cool new gear in the trees. Every Tree Stuff party is 100% free, so there's no reason to not bring your family, friends, coworkers, and acquaintances. Check our Facebook events page to learn about upcoming Tree Stuff parties, and sign up to be notified when there's a new Tree Stuff party in your neck of the woods at treestuff.com parties. It's all about seeing friends, making new friends, and having fun in the trees. I hope you can make it to a party soon. All right, we are back um, from that little commercial break there. Uh, I do have a few questions here for you. Um, All right, go ahead. Well, we've just got uh, Adam Williams just saying Peter DeVries is a beast. Um, <laughs> that's not really Thanks, a question, Adam. but I think that that's a good observation there. Um, Colm Hickey is asking, where did you originally learn splicing, and how did you get started out doing uh, splicing and was it from a wizard? <laughs> um, so good question, Colin. How's, how's it going? Thanks for watching out in Ireland. Um, so I pretty much started, uh, dabbling at it myself, watching YouTube videos and, um, getting instructions off the internet where I could find them and just kept on working up from there. Uh, I was a lucky enough to also host two fids and fibers in my shop here with uh, Mark P. Uh, he's a wealth of knowledge and highly recommend uh, his uh, course. Um, so from there, it's just continually working with the rope and, and splicing. I'm usually in the shop several times a week um doing uh, some custom orders for for people all over the world so it's uh it's an ongoing uh, learning process and uh, with that uh, i'm lucky enough to have two uh, locations that i can send my splicing for testing uh, one of them is uh, security landry uh, they are a uh, supplier out of quebec uh, canada uh, they have a testing bed there so I can send my splices to him to be tested and uh, also been working with uh, Fleming College uh, in Lindsay, Ontario. Uh, they also have a testing bed um, that I've uh, sent stuff there. And uh, the nice thing is they're a little bit closer to me than Security Landry. So I actually can go out there and uh, see the splices uh, get broken. So 
that's all part of the ongoing process of it. Uh, I just keep keep working away at it and stay up on your testing. I think that's a you brought up you started on something that's a, a good thing to talk about here is uh, how can you tell if what you're splicing is safe to use? Uh, how can you tell? A good question. Because uh, you can't, it, it will, you can tell a bad splice from a good splice uh, most of the time, but there's sometimes you can't see what's going on in the rope. So that's where uh, testing and uh, actually pulling splices apart to see why they broke or how, how, how why did they break there or uh, why didn't it break there? Uh, so that's all part of the uh, the fun process of working with ropes is the the breaking aspect and uh, to be able to tell the difference between a good and bad is really getting your testing done to show that the splicing that you're doing is um, proper and safe. Okay, and. Um... What's uh? I, I've got one other thing. I think I'm gonna answer this from Jose Antonio Murillo Navarro, um, and that's how can you get the kit for splicing and rigging? Um, I know that uh, I know that you have just kind of accumulated your stuff uh, throughout the years or made it your your yourself. Um, we do at Tree Stuff have uh, two slight splicing kits. We have a basic splicing kit and an advanced splicing kit. Uh, that were, were put together by some splicing experts that we've had. Um, and then we do also have some books on splicing as well as the uh, Tree U splicing series that you can purchase. And uh, they're very in-depth videos, uh, hours and hours of them with Nick Araya uh, from down in Los Angeles uh, going in detail over uh, almost to all of the uh, uh, splices that you can do. So I think right now, unless anyone has something that pops up, I think I'm about ready to get into what loopies was next. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll get into, uh, the next, uh, one of two splices. I'm just going to move the, sorry, chair out of the way here. So next, uh, so we're going to kind of put, uh, what we've been working on, uh, together uh with burying the rope inside itself uh creating locks uh so we're just going to keep an, uh advancing that so we're going to make a loopy sling uh most of you probably know what that is uh have seen them use them um so basically you're going to have two end splices so they look like this so basically i'm taking the tail of the rope and burying it into itself and then lock stitching them so this part can't pull out so we're going to start with one of those on the one end of the rope and then we're going to take the tail other tail end before we do another back splice we're going to pass it back through the hollow braid using a specific measurement and we'll go over that and then once that's created you have the loop for a loopy um, and then to finish it off we do that back splice again lock stitch it so it doesn't come out all right so we'll get started with that so i'm using a half inch again here uh hollow braid t-rex from teufelberger so first thing we're going to do, uh, tail end of the rope, we're going to mark half a fid. So I'm using half inch, that's 11 inches, so five and a half inches. I will make my mark, so I have some inch marks on my work table. And I'm going to mark that nice and dark so you can see it. So that's half a fid. And then we're going to do another mark, half a fid. So basically, a full fid cut in half. So I'm going to take my Selma fid and move this rope down here. 
while I do this so I can stand back so you can see it better. So we're gonna take, open up the fibers here and we want this tail end to go in here and come out that side. So open that up. And again, be careful not to split the fibers. So you don't want to, I'll give you an example, a better example. Uh, let's, so that's like splitting a fiber right there. You don't want to do that. So I'll put that back out. And you also don't want to catch any as you're pulling it through. So coming back out. It's a little sticky because it's got the wax coating. So because it's so short, a uh, short piece, I can jam that down underneath here. And then I have the tab that's going to catch the strands to pull it through for me. All right. So I can set that into the Selma Fid, pull that back, and then work it through like so. So it's going to look like this. And then I can take my fit off, put that down, and we're just going to milk this back through onto itself. I'll do that. And that's going to create one of the back splices. All right. So then it should look something like that. But now we have this tail sticking through. So what we'll do for video sake, we'll make a mark where it exits so we can see it, pull that back. So we know that to bury the rest of this rope, we got to cut it below that mark. So I'm going to do that. Take your scissors. And then you can milk that back through. So then you have your back splice. So we've started the loopy. So now, we need to bring the tail end through and then back out. All right, so what we gotta do for that, we wanna try and get out any kinks out of the rope. So I'm just gonna pull the rope out, get all those kinks out. So we have a nice, piece to work with. All right. So next step, we got to figure out the entry point and the exit point. So for half inch, it's going to be a full fid plus a short fid. So half an inch, uh, your 11 inches is full fid plus a short is 14. So your total is going to be 15. So you can mark it out on the chart, but right here you can see I have half inch fid plus short, five eighths fid plus short and three quarters fid. These are the three um, sizes I use the most. So I have another mark out of camera shot, shot that uh, has a mark like this. So I can line it up quickly and make my exit point mark. So then we have, we're gonna enter where, sorry, we're gonna enter where the back splice finished and come out where we put the second mark. All right, so we're gonna do that again with my Selma FID. You can do it with any of the FIDs. 
I'm just going to do with the, the one that's easiest to work with. So with this one here, you're going to go in on this side of the rope. So we're going to go in on this side of the rope. Bring that in close for you. So we're going to go in here. But when we get to our exit point, right there, I'm going to come out on the opposite side of my entrance side, if that makes sense. And I'll show you. So again, we're going to open up the fibers, pass our fit in. Again, not to catch any strands. All right, so there's my mark. I'll bring that in so you can see. So we're coming, we've entered on this side. So we're gonna, this is the side that I entered on. I'm gonna exit on this side. All right. So I'm going to do that. Before I pull that all the way through, again, make sure any kinks are out of the rope. So there we are. It's nice and straight. And then we're going to take the tail end, attach it to the Selma FID. Again, if you're using a tubular FID, add a piece of tape. Um, keep it from pulling out. If you're using a wire fit, then uh, what you would end up doing is you're going to come in on this side, out this side, and then pull it through. I've seen some people also um, just do a heavy tape job on the tail end, and you're able to slide it through as well, just like a fit. So it's really whatever tools you have available. Um, but for this type of uh, splicing, Selma Fit is definitely the best one to have. All right, so pull that off. So we've entered there, gone through, exit on the opposite side, and we'll just pull that through. All right, so now we have a nice big loopy sling so to finish off this sling we have to put a back splice in this tail end so we can't pull that back through what we just spliced through so it basically creates a lock so you can't pull it through on itself so same as this back splice we're going to take half a fid five and a half inches make a mark so five and a half inches make a mark another five and a half inches make another mark full fit so full fit half a fit and then pass it back through so we'll do that this one's a little bit longer than the demonstrator one that i had so same as I've been saying we want to make sure that we don't catch anything. You don't want to split any strands. Go like that. Slide that through. Get your tail end. Set that into the Selma FID. All right, and then pull that through. So again, tail fed in through here, and then we can milk that up. I'm just gonna do that out of focus because it's easier for me to do. All right, so there we have a back splice again. 
and same thing for me i know where to cut it but for video sake we're going to mark it where it exits so you know where to cut it pull that back like so get your scissors and then milk it back in then you have back splice so we'll make this a little bit smaller so you can see we have created a loopy sling so the next step uh, to do is obviously what we've been doing to finish off all these splices with uh, hollow braid we're going to do a lock stitch three down this side three down this side 90 degree turn three up three up and then tie them off together cut them burn them and it should look like this so this is where i started one two three 90 degree turn one Oh, this one sorry that one only has two but one two and then back through the starting point tie that off cut it off and then be careful when you're burning it down and melting it and that will give you your finished loopy sling do we have any questions Uh, at the same time or on the same splice uh is it okay um i would say uh no it's not uh it you don't need it because you're basically putting it in twice and now you could be possibly damaging more fibers than you need to so either choose which one you want to do either stick with the lock stitch and do just the lock stitch or you can do a whip stitch on all those um it's not necessary to do both hope that answers your question steve yep um so t-rex here i'll have a little seat then you can see me. Um, so T-Rex uh, comes in uh, different sizes ranging from uh, seven, six, oh no, three eighths, sorry, three eighths all the way to seven eighths um, and multiple uh, lengths or widths in between. Uh, I like it because it's very easy to splice you probably can say that about any of the uh, hollow braids um but it's it's nice to work with um it does have a wax coating on it uh which is put on there to help uh keep it from picking that much i know that's one complaint from some people uh that it does pick easily um but from my use uh at my uh work we've been using uh it on a daily basis and they stand up uh, over the test of time so yeah that's and, and the other reason i like it is uh everyone likes colors so if they're nice and bright colors are easy to see and easy to distinguish if you know what colors are uh the sizes so like white and orange is half inch uh yellow and orange is five eighths green and orange is three quarters so it's easy to distinguish uh what size rope you're working with and it's available at treestuff.com yes and That's it's also key. available there <laughs> all right um <laughs> the uh, uh i 
do have a question here um, about what the difference is between a lock stitch and a whip stitch. I know you talked about it a little bit earlier, um, but what, uh, I, I guess, could you go over works? Is that something you can do in a minute or two? Yeah, if you give me a second, I can get an example of um, a whip stitch. Uh, then I can just show the difference between the two. And like I said, either one is fine to use. I just prefer to use a lock stitch when using um, hollow braid. It just it looks cleaner to me. Um, and then for a double braid, like your climbing lines, um, that there I'll use a, uh, a whip stitch when I'm splicing those. So if you give me a second, I'll grab a climbing line that has a whip stitch in it. And I will be right back. While we're uh, waiting for him to find the right rope, uh, I'm going to go ahead and just say that at Tree Stuff we have uh, entire splicing kits available. We have a basic kit and we also have a an advanced kit that uh, will get you started with almost all of the tools uh, and some of the, the, the books and uh, materials that you'll need to properly learn how to do splicing. Um, so go ahead and check those out. We also have the Tree U Splicing Series with Nick Araya. Um, their videos uh, that are great, we've got them on almost every kind of splicing uh, that you want to do. Um, so check those out if you are looking at getting into splicing. Alright, I think we've got All right. here. I will take away the yep. elevator music. All right, we're back. So question was uh, the difference between the two. Uh, again, I just like when using, pull those up right there. When using hollow braid rope, it just, me personally, I like the look of this better than um, like a bulky section of stitching. Uh, it, it's cleaner, uh, but again, either one is fine. To use so to go to a whip stitch i'll use whip stitch on climbing lines here so basically you're wrapping around see if i can get into focus here it's got to hold it try holding the palm of your hand behind it so it there we go that's working a little bit all right so there you're just wrapping um, your whipping twine. It's a smaller gauge uh, whipping twine. And uh, I, do, I do 14 wraps. And then you're feeding these points here to here. Go in and then out, in and out as you're going around the rope. So you'll go in this side, out this side, then back in and out and then in and cross over and back and forth basically. And then same thing, tie it off like I do the lock stitch and then melt it down. So you can use either or, um, but I like, like I said, I like that for a climbing line because it's, for me, it's cleaner and it's easier with a climbing line because now you're working with a lot more material here. Um, and then with, the lock stitch on the hollow braid, I think is quicker myself and um, it looks cleaner. So that's really the difference between the two. They're both gonna work. Um, so don't be afraid to use either on, uh, on double blade rope. Uh, you can also do uh, a lock stitch is perfectly fine as well. Um, as a whip stitch so hopefully that answers their question yep that's uh i think you answered a few questions there in that 
uh, I think we are about ready to go ahead and get on to the whoopee sling. All right, so we'll get a example. Again, most of you probably know what a whoopee sling is because you use them daily. Uh, so just combining now a couple of the skills that we've done tonight uh, into a sling. So the second splice we did was a locking brummel. So we're going to incorporate that. And this is where I said that you could add that shape sleeve, protection sleeve. I also have it on the other side as well. I'm not going to put one on for the demonstrator piece, but just as an example, you can do it with or without. So again, that was our first um, or second place, sorry, locking Brummel. And then this is very similar to the loopy that we just did, but instead of entering where we've had our um, end splice, we're going to enter and create the loop down here. Enter here. This will be a predetermined uh, size or length of FIDs, and I'll get to that. And then exit right where your tail tapers down or ends. So that is uh, the whoopee, and then we'll finish it off like the loopy with a back splice. And then like we do with all of them, lock stitch or whip stitch. And then same here, lock stitch or whip stitch your locking Brummel. All right, so this is a uh, three quarter inch T-Rex. That is what I'm going to use. It's really nice and easy to splice because it opens up really easily. So to start this splice, again, we're going to start from the bitter end and then we're going to measure one full fid plus a short fid. So three quarter inch, we have a, I'm going to do a little mark, get my marker. So our full fid mark is there. And then a short fid, I'll mark it dark for you guys to see. So that is tail end, work your way up to your mark. And then just like the locking Brummel, that's mark A. We wanna make mark B, our I. So create a nice size I. I'll do the same as the other one, 21 inches makes a Good size usable eye that you can girth hitch a porter wrap to. Um, if you're using uh, uh, a block pulley, it'll fit in there, no problem. So it's uh, just a good size. So line those two up. All right, and then we're going to get out back to Swedish Fid and we are going to enter mark B, which is on, I'll switch that around. Easier for me to work on this side. So um, mark B, we're gonna enter and the bitter end is gonna go through. So we'll do that right now. So same thing, open up the fibers. Be sure not to catch a fiber so again we don't want something like that or you don't want to split the fiber like that all right so we want to have a nice clean one two three one two three on each side all right take your bitter end and pass that through all right so same thing we're going to line up a and b together and now line those colors up like so and then we're going to open
open up your hollow braid. Same thing. Don't catch anything. See, I just caught one. All right, there we go. And now we're going to take the tail end and pass that through, just like we did with the locking Brummel dead eye splice. And we're basically creating a dead eye at this point. At this point. So if there's any twists or kinks, get rid of those. Bring that in, bring that back in. So it's nice and tight. And there you have your locking Brummel. And then from there, we're going to bury the tail like we did. So same thing. We're going to make a little mark for you guys at home. So tail's going to go in. So we're going to make that mark right there. See that? And then we're going to measure down one fid plus half a fid. So for three quarter inch, Again, 16 inches plus half, half of that is eight. So I take eight and we'll make a mark at eight so that you guys can see. So that's basically where this end is gonna go in, through, and then out there. And then when you milk the rope back, it will get sucked back in, all right? So I'm just going to flip this rope around, make it a little bit easier for me. Move that chair out of the way. All right. So again, you can use tubular fid, Selma fid. If you can find one big enough, I couldn't, so I made my own. Or a wire fid. So we'll go through. Come out the exit point, like so. So we got like that, starting there, behind your two locks. Attach the tail end, put it in a little bit. Save my piece of tape from earlier. Try to reuse the pieces of tape if I can. Attach that, and then push it through. Okay, I'm just gonna turn that around. Again, make it easier for me. So now we have the rope going through. Pull that off nice and tight. Take the tape off. Use that again. So we have our eye locking Brummel buried in. So same as the dead eye sling, we're going to pull out half a fid. So that's 16 inches is a full. So half a fid is eight. We're going to make a line there. So with three quarter inch, that's eight inches. Take tape off. And then we'll fan that out like we did to create the nice even taper. Do it like this so you guys can see probably a little bit better. So open up the fibers. And again, like I said, depending on the uh, instructions you're following, 
Uh, I know some uh, whoopee sling instructions, you don't do any taper, you just bury it solid like that. Uh, some you're gonna mark it at, a, at say this half a fid and then mark a pair, skip a pair, mark a pair, skip a pair, mark a pair and pull out all the mark pairs. So again, just follow the instructions of the rope that you're using. So I'm following the rope, the New England Teufelberger rope uh, in, in, or instructions, sorry, for their rope, which you can find on uh, their website. Most manufacturers have instructions out there. All right, so I got that back to there. Fan that out nice and even, like so. And then we're gonna cut on an angle like that. And again, be careful not to cut yourself. So I'll pull that away. Get the ones that I missed. Okay. So now we got a nice even taper. So it should look something like that. And then again, give this one last pull down so you get it nice and tight up against the locked brummels. And then I'm going to attach it to my bench. And then we're going to milk the rope back through and that will all disappear. Just like that. So you do that a couple times just to get any loose bits out. So we have that all taken care of. So next step, normally if I'm doing a sling, I would do, I'd lock stitch this right now so that any movement that I'm doing uh, won't loosen this off. But for time's sake, we're gonna just continue on with the splice. So we're gonna just take out any of the kinks in the rope. All right, and then from that point, we are going to uh, measure where it exited the rope. So we're here. So if we look in here, you'll see the tail end. I don't know if we can see that or not, but so you get to where the tail end finishes. So we're about here. Be close to where your mark is. Um, just due to expansion, this mark changes the length of it. So usually it's pretty close to that mark. So we'll go from close to that mark because I know that the end, because I can see there's no tail there. So this will be my new mark that I'm going to work from. So like I said, with a, a whoopee sling, uh, similar to the loopy sling, we're going to pass this tail back through itself. Um, and with that, uh, it's going to be a full fid, so 16 inches uh, for three quarter inch, plus a short fid, uh, 4.75. So you're 20 and three quarters. But again, I have my mark here, so I don't have to measure every time. I can just line up my rope to my marks. and make that mark. And then similar to the loopy, we're gonna now take the tail and go through the rope. But with the loopy, we went this way. So with a whoopee to create that loop, to create, to create this loop, sorry, get it on. So to create this loop, we're gonna enter the mark that we made here. So that will be our entrance. This will be our exit down here. All right. So I will flip the rope around so it's easier for me to work so you guys can see. Again, get all the twists out of the rope. Um, and then with 
uh, this splice uh, going, entering the one side, it will exit the same side. So, and just like I said on all the other ones, be careful not to catch any strands. And then we're gonna exit the same side. All right, like that. All right. And then take your tail end. Again, just get any twists in the rope out. So, and this is where you would add the protective shafe on or the sleeve. So you can add that on now before you put this through. So put that into the fid. Reuse my tape for the third time. And I'll probably still use it for another splice. Make sure it's on there nice and tight. And then milk it through. And pull that in through. So now you've created that down so it's a little bit lower you've created that loop for the loopy so to finish this splice now just like the or sorry whoopee um to finish the splice it's now like the loopy we're going to do a back splice in this piece of rope to finish it off and then the last thing we do is lock stitch so again half half a fid, so 16 inches for three quarter inch, so that's eight inches. I have eight inches marked out right here for me. So I can mark that there. Second mark at eight inches. Full fid, half fid. And same thing, I'm gonna enter be sure not to catch any strands. Exit. Be sure not to catch any strands. Like so. Say I told you I was going to use that tape one more time. It's not getting, it's not very sticky anymore, so hopefully it will still work for me. If not, you guys can all laugh at me and I'll redo it. So I'll push that through. Yeah, see, it didn't. Figures. Last one. So I'll get a new piece of tape. Should have known. But that's all right. All right, so new piece of tape. This one, you'd need a good piece of tape because it's such a short piece to pull through. Um, and it's easy to pull, pull out. But I thought I could do it. So make sure that's nice and tight on there. All right, wiggle that through. Perfect. So I'm through. And same thing with the back splice. Take that extra piece off so you guys can see. So you have your back splice, like so. And then you have your tail piece that's sticking out. 
We'll mark that where it exits so you know where to cut it. Pull that back, cut below that line. And then milk that back splice back down the rope and it disappears. And then you have your back splice and you have a completed whoopee sling. So you have again your eye, two locks, berry, and then your loop to create your whoopee. So to finish that off again, like I did on this sling, your back splice, make sure to lock stitch. So you're going to enter one, two, three on both sides, turn it 90 degrees, go up one, two, three, both sides, and then come back out where you started. Tie that off, cut it, and then melt it down. And then you'll do the same thing right there. One, two, three. One, two, three. And then back out here, cut it off and melt it down. And then you have your whoopee sling. And that is four slings in under two hours hey thanks again for this awesome webinar peter yep. that's my bad sorry yep four so slings under uh, two hours i think that you did pretty well there yeah so uh we started off again with that straight berry just to get you familiar with the rope and then uh went up one step to the locking brummel and then one more step is loopy, so you're adding the back splice into it, and then we combine the loopy, the back splice, and the locking brummel to create your whoopee sling. So that's your uh, very quick uh, webinar on uh, rigging slings. Well, great. Thank you very much. Um, I don't think we have any comments yet. Um uh here except we've got a lot of people saying thanks and and great job um i do have a question what can you give us a few tips on hardware that you're using there are sorry tools that you're using like your scissors um i know you talked about the fids a lot um a little bit about the cell makers needles um yeah just any tips and tricks you have there yeah for sure so there's different size needles so I'll get in close here, lay them down, and then you can see them. So I use the two larger needles for hollow braids, and then the small Sailor Makers needle for any uh, 16 strand or double braid splices to put the whipping stitch uh, in them. Uh, so those. Again, they're available at Tree Stuff. Um, the small needle has a very sharp point. Uh, the larger needles, they will still jab you, but they're a little bit more dull. Um, so those are the three different sizes that I use on a regular basis. And then we'll go scissors. I'm thinking I'm gonna probably need a new pair of these soon. Uh, they're getting a little dull because I've used them so much. Uh, they're cool. Um, I know you used to have them at Tree Stuff. I'm not sure if you still have this exact one uh, still available. And then I also have another smaller pair of cloths as well. So I believe this pair is still available uh, at Tree Stuff. Um, and then I go over again uh, Swedish Fids. Two different sizes um, 
for the hollow braids, I pretty much use this one for all hollow braids from half inch to seven eighths. And then I'll use the small Swedish fit for uh, 16 strand and double strand. Or sorry, double braid. And then uh, to finish off, uh, tubular fids. Uh, you can buy these singles. Uh, this is uh, Samson uh, tubular fid. You can buy them uh, singles as well as kits. Um, they're, like I said, they're very handy for hollow braid. These are the best, in my opinion, for hollow braid, uh, the Selma fid. Um, but they only range, I can only find, uh, this is the largest, which is half inch or 13 mil. And then I have four smaller ones um, that go fit into this uh, fid. Um, so that's why I, I didn't make this. I should say my father-in-law made this for me. Um, but this is basically a homemade Swedish fid, same idea, opened up at the top minus the tab on the bottom. But again, a piece of tape works just as good as the tab. And it's always handy to have tape, a marker, and then your hey, thanks again. Fid. So this is works mostly, I use this mostly for double braids. All right, perfect. Well, again, thanks for everyone that uh, joined and thanks for everyone that's going to hopefully watch uh, after the broadcast. Uh, again, thank you to Tree Stuff for having me for this webinar. Um, I'm honored and humbled. And also a big thank you to Jason from Teufelberger for uh, all the ropes that I got to use uh, during the webinar. So I'll send it back to Jake and have a good night, guys. Hey, thanks again for this awesome webinar, Peter. I hope all of you were able to follow along and now have some pretty cool slings. And remember, do get those tested before you uh, try them out. Now we'll have that quiz link up in just a minute, but first we wanna tell you about a few things coming up. In just a few weeks, November 7th through the 9th is this year's TCIA Expo in Pittsburgh. The Tree Stuff team will be there and we'll be at booth 453 on the upper level right by the food, which is always good, and next to the Petzl booth. So come by, we'll have our micro rigging lab up for you to test out, and tons of great deals, free stuff, and plenty more. You don't wanna miss it, so come by, say hi, hang out. We definitely love to see you. Our next webinar is on Thursday, December 5th, from six to eight Eastern time, the business of managing high-risk trees with our good pal, Nick Araya, he's going to be doing that, and he uh, is also going to be completing the third in a series of how to manage your uh, tree care business, how to manage high-risk trees, and how to manage the business of the tree care business. So you don't want to miss that one. You don't have to watch all three, of course, to uh, get information out of it, but we do have those posted on YouTube for you. So check out our webinar December 5th with Nick Araya. Thanks again for being here, and thanks to everyone who's been a part of this one. I'm Jake Miller, we'll see you soon.